Welcome to the Twimmel AI Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Hey, what's up everyone? A few quick updates from Twimmel HQ. As some of you may have noticed, we recently relaunched the Twimmel newsletter. If you've already signed up, awesome. If not, well, you're missing out on weekly podcast updates, recommendations from the team, and much more. Head over to twimmelai.com slash newsletter to get signed up. After you check out today's podcast, I encourage you to check out our latest demo cast. This time around, I was joined by Vila Tulos, who you might remember from our conversation late last year about Netflix's recently open source library, Metaflow, for building and managing real life data science projects. Based on the data we've seen with our previous couple of demo casts, we've decided to no longer publish the audio only versions of those here in the main podcast feed. So you'll need to jump over to twimmelai.com slash Metaflow to check it out. And now on to the show. All right, everyone, I am on the line with David Adaibo. David is co-founder and CTO of Analytical AI, as well as a Kaggle Grandmaster. David, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Happy to be here. Uh, you know what? I am really looking forward to this chat. I think this is the first uh, time I've had a sibling on the show. I interviewed your brother, Stephen Adaibo, back in July of last year, where we were talking about retinal image generation. And uh, he was up on Twitter recently talking you up and your conquests on Kaggle. <laughs> and I thought, man, I've got to get this conversation as well. So congratulations for being the first sibling, at least to my knowledge, on the podcast. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, why don't we start out by having you share a little bit about your background? How did you come to work on machine learning? When I started my PhD, I was interested in machine learning. I wasn't quite sure where to go back then. So there was a lot of uh, literature review, a lot of just digging around. And back then, you know, I read a lot of papers. I, I, I kind of tried to get a sense of where to go uh, to get uh, useful information. And uh, Kaggle kept creeping up and coming up in various in various things I read, and so I finally joined Kaggle, and it kind of it kind of put it gave me an opportunity to put some of that uh, theoretical background into practice, and it made a lot of things made a lot more sense when you actually practiced. So, what were you studying for your PhD? I was looking to uh, investigate uh, deep learning in medical imaging and how the advances in deep learning at the time could be applied to various medical imaging problems. And that sounds like an interest that runs in the family. Yeah, it's, it, uh, yeah, it does. <laughs> you know, besides from, you know, any kind of genetic contribution, what sparked your interest in that? Um, I wanted, actually, the first uh, neural network I ever, I wanted to see if I could build something to recognize a face in an image. Mm -hmm. And this was actually before I started my, I, I selected my thesis topic. Mm -hmm. And so that was really how I got really interested in machine learning because it was something I was kind of blindly doing. Yeah. And, you know, as you're digging around, I wrote my first neural network in, in C sharp, which was, it worked horribly. And this was in 2012. And, okay. you know, uh, that kind of made me realize that you read about how neural networks should work and all these things, but you never really, I never really knew at the time what, what the appropriate frameworks to use and 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 w how you go about it, basically. So, mm. um, and so what? Why C sharp? Were you a Microsoft developer? Yeah, I was. A, I, 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 yeah, I was a Microsoft. <laughs> I was a Microsoft Enterprise developer. I, I had done all the Microsoft certifications and stuff, so I was pretty good at C sharp at the time. So. I said, let me let me try to do this in C sharp, and it was just the absolute wrong idea and the wrong approach to use at the time. But you know, wow. if you if you have a hammer, you know, you try to. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm putting the pieces together correctly, you were the a Microsoft Enterprise developer before you went back for your PhD. Yeah. What prompted you to go back for your PhD? Well, it's something I always wanted to do. You know, after I got my master's, I worked in industry. A little bit, and I always knew I, I needed to uh, kind of pivot back and and complete the PhD. So, mm -hmm. 
that was kind of it was something that was in the plans before i but i wanted to after being in school for so long you want to work and gain some experience so yeah nice uh and so you started working on neural networks in in c sharp and kind of you know banged away with that hammer that you you had and it was it was the absolute wrong wrong thing to do i just didn't know where to go where to start back then you kind of were pursuing you know this formal you know research and, and education with the phd but then you realized that there was kind of a a practical complement to that in yeah. kaggle yeah um how, how did you start with you know once you you know create an account and join kaggle quote unquote like how did you actually start did you just jump in and do a competition so I actually created my account for the first time in I think it was 2014 or 2015, mm-hmm. and I didn't actually. I I looked around. I read the. I didn't actually start competing until a year later. Okay. So I first joined, and then I I just poked around, and then later on I kept working on my stuff, and I got better at it. I I kind of identified the right frameworks to use. I got a little bit more comfortable, and then I think I did my first competition in in uh, 2016, and and that was I think the data science bowl at the time. That one was for uh, trying to detect the volume of uh, of of ejection in um, in heart um, cardiograms. Or so that was my first competition. Okay. Uh, and that competition, I did okay, you know, but I didn't do really well. But mm-hmm. it was good experience to kind of get my feet wet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And were you, were you, had you partnered up with folks for that one or were you working independently? Yeah. There was another guy that we're, uh, I, uh, Jason Zeng. We're both mm-hmm. uh, in the same program and we're both doing kind of deep learning in medical imaging. So we both went into that competition together. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And so, that was 2016. Fast forward to 2020, and you've seen quite a bit of success in Kaggle competitions. Can you talk about some of the uh, your more recent results, or at least the results that you're most proud of? Yeah. So um, shortly after that competition, there was another one that was uh, for also a medical imaging related competition. It was for segmenting ultrasound images in the neck. And there was, uh, fortunately for me, uh, um, that competition was actually the competition I did best in. So there was a, there was a new architecture, a new paper that was written on this uh, thing called, it's a, an encoder decoder network. It's called a UNet, And it hadn't really been used on Kaggle before, mm-hmm. that architecture. And I'd read the paper about the architecture and when I read the paper, it, because I thought about this too, you know, like how do you segment things? It's something I've been thinking about. But when I read that paper, the, the ideas in the, in the paper made a lot of sense. Mm. Right? It was like, and it almost seemed so obvious that what, that was what you were supposed to do to segment images with convolutional neural networks, where you try to preserve, um, you try to preserve the localization information from the original images and things. So that paper really sparked my interest. I, I read it. I was... I was a fan of it, and this competition came up, and somebody mentioned it. And uh, back then, there was a framework called Lasage and uh, Theano, and those frameworks are deprecated now. But back then, that was actually what I did, what I used, and I, 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 I said, okay, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm try, I'm going to try to implement this UNet architecture, and I did. And I, I had no hopes of actually doing well in that competition. Uh, but I said, let me give it a shot. I implemented it. I trained uh, the network, and to my surprise, it worked. And I was so I was just so happy that it worked. I, I had no idea I was going to finish in second place in the competition. So, um, so that's probably the one I was most proud of because um, I had to hack a lot of things uh, back then. You know, there was even in 2016, there was there was not there were not a lot of best practices and how you do segmentation, mm-hmm. even back then. So there was this, a lot of the frameworks out there had not specified how you do data augmentation. 
you know, for image and masks, because when you train, when you train segmentation networks to avoid overfitting, you have to augment the image and the mask together, and you have to find the right kind of augmentation strategies and things like that. So um, I hacked, there was the, I, I created a good augmentation strategy, a good augmentation framework. And, you know, I saw a lot of people in the challenge were struggling with this idea, you know, and they were not probably implementing the right augmentation strategies because, you know, uh, like I said, this was the first time they used this unit in this competition, but I was kind of a little bit ahead of the game mm -hmm. back then. And um, so, yeah, so I finished in second place and it was, it was, it was probably my, the proudest uh, challenge. Um, That's awesome. And that was out of like 950 teams, right? Yeah, that was out of 950 teams. Were there other teams that used the UNET architecture in that competition? I think a lot of the teams used the UNET, but they were implemented in, they, were, they used, they probably all used the same UNET. And probably that was something that gave me an advantage because uh, I don't think people had taken the time to learn how to build that unit architecture back then. So uh, somebody posts that, hey, this is a great implementation of the unit and everybody just follows the crowd and uses it. And I think that kind of, if you did something different or you implemented your own and you kind of improved it a little bit, maybe more than what everybody else was using, you had a chance of doing a little better than they did if you kind of implemented it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's one interesting thing that I find about Kaggle is that it is both at the same time, you know, kind of inherently this competition, right? That's that's yeah. what it is. But it's a competition. there's also a lot of collaboration and people sharing kind yes. of results and kernels and things yeah, like yeah, that. Yes, yes, yes. You know, talk a little bit about that dynamic from the perspective of someone who participates in it. Yeah, so the kernels are great because it gives it gives a good um, starting point. Like you can take a kernel and utilize it and kind of quickly get up to speed in what uh, the challenge is about. Um, and it gives you, it kind of uh, does a lot of the preliminary hard work you might have had to do to kind of, kind of figure out how to get started. Uh, the next level, they're great. So the kernels are great in, in that it gets you started. But being a competition, it's it's uh, my approach is generally that if you do what everybody else does, you're not going to win. So usually, you usually have to take those kernels and try to try to improve them and add your own unique um, improvement or optimizations to them because it's a competition after all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the kernels are great and the sharing is great, and it gets people up and running fast. Yeah. It sounds like you're you had the success with the ultrasound nerve segmentation competition uh, relatively early in your Kaggle journey. Yeah, it was actually my 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 second or third competition. So I, I was pretty, that's why I'm also that's proud of it. That's great encouragement. <laughs> yeah, it was, I got up there pretty quick. I, I think I was, for, I, like I said, I was really surprised. I said, let me implement this. And it kind of gave me the confidence that, you know, if you just apply your ideas, you know, you might, you should give it a shot. Just just give it a shot, and and um, you never know how it turns, it turns out. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's amazing to think that you know just three years ago was kind of the wild wild west when it you know comes to these kinds of problems. How has the game evolved over the past three years? And not to say that that what your your accomplishment was easy, but is it you know is it as easy? Is it still possible to? you know, do the kinds of things that, that you did in that competition. Yeah. Um, it, you know, talk a little bit about how it has evolved. Yeah. So uh, it's evolved because now, you know, like then it was the Wild West. Now uh, things, a lot of things you could have done in the past to gain an edge are now standardized, well understood. So that's good because it, it moves the field forward. You know, people have settled on best practices and best strategies um, so it, it definitely has evolved. Uh, things have improved. It gets harder now to win competitions without really innovating or really looking into peculiar things about the data sets at, or the problem that you can exploit. So there's definitely, it's not as, it's. I think it's easier to start now than it was back then because you have a lot of um, kind of examples and things to go by. But it still, being a competition platform, it still requires 
pushing the limits a little bit in terms of innovating and finding uh, kind of things that could give you an edge. Mm -hmm. So can you give us some examples of, you know, how you've innovated in, in competitions and, you know, where you found patterns in the data that you were able to exploit? How has this played out for you? Okay, so the next uh, really good competition I did in was uh, one sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the TSA, for detecting um, for detecting uh, threats in the ProVision body scanners you see in the airports, aka the nudoscopes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and that was the uh, largest competition on Kegel in terms of prize money. So it was kind of like the highest profile competition, and we came in. I came in third place in that one. And that was another one that requires required what was the prize money. Uh, the overall purse was about one point five million dollars. Wow! So, um, so in that one, we 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 had to innovate because the data set was peculiar. It was very large. It was the largest data set ever on Kaggle, and so that required the barriers on that one were required uh, kind of solving the problem of dealing with really, really large data and terabytes. And, and you know, you had to get an edge in that. And then you had to, the data was also three-dimensional and uh, you had to come up with architectures that could deal with three-dimensional data. So the, so in that, that was another competition where there were no best practices in terms of how you go about solving this problem. So if you could uh, it was one of those, another one of those low hanging fruits where if you could quickly come up with an uh, optimal approach, you were more likely to do really well in it. And in that one, we came up with a very creative architecture that allowed us to perform well. And so did you join that competition because it looked interesting or did you join no. in that competition because you saw that there were these issues that would provide kind of a, a direction for you to innovate in. Yeah, so that competition, like I said, I was still in my PhD program back then. And part of my research was dealing with medical imaging data. And a lot, a lot of the medical imaging data are three-dimensional CT or MRI. Mm. And I'd already started thinking about three-dimensional imaging. So I'd already started, the architecture actually used was one I'd already started doing research in. I wrote about in my thesis for handling the difficulties with uh, the three-dimensional imaging are their large volumes. And even with the state-of-the-art GPUs we have today, if you want to process at the resolution, original resolution of all these medical images, it's it's often impossible, right? Without downsampling or reducing the size of the data mm -hmm. to, a, to a point where you actually use lose useful information. So uh, I'd started working on on some of these problems. And I'd actually already used the architecture I used on uh, uh, Parkinson's disease data set just to see if we could uh, detect uh, or classify Parkinson's disease in, 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 in brain scans. So it was something I was working on. Mm -hmm. And when that challenge came around, I quickly identified that the data looked very similar to the medical imaging data I was working with. Mm. And I already had an approach I'd been investigating. So I said, we're just going to crack this method loose on, on the data. And it worked out well. Nice. Can you can you walk us through the method? Yeah. So it's um, usually most of the CNNs out there are, are work with two-dimensional data. And a lot of the methods uh, in, in deep learning work with two-dimensional imaging. And that's well understood. But when you come to 3D, um, the the memory requirements, they grow a lot. So uh, this method I use kind of combined. So you want to learn features in, in the two-dimensional space, but there's also a third dimension, which is the third axis, where you also can correlate features across multiple two-dimensional two-dimensional two images because the volume is essentially a stack of two-dimensional images. So what we did was we combined the, the convolutional neural network, the 2D convolutional neural network with an LSTM. And an LSTM is a, a different kind of architecture that kind of models uh, sequences of, of data. So, and it requires less, um, the input vectors are much smaller than images. So if you could use the convolutional neural network to kind of learn the two dimensional vectors that you need to feed into the LSTM, you could reduce the memory requirements uh, required to train a three dimensional volume. So that was kind of the innovation in the architecture. Uh, mm, we're able so, to 
the, the so you it, it sounds like you're using the if I get this right you're using the CNN to do something along the lines of dimensionality reduction of exactly. your two dimensional exactly. images and exactly. you're feeding that into an LSTM yes exactly that's okay. what it is interesting so by doing that, we didn't have to reduce the resolution of the input images. So we're able to learn rich two-dimensional features. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, the, 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 the body scanners, they give you this kind of three-dimensional view of the person. Yeah. And there's kind of a correlation from frame to frame. Uh, if you see something in one frame and you don't see it in a, another frame, in the next frame, uh, is, it, is it a false positive? Is it a false negative? So that kind of temporal effect of kind of going around something uh, kind of also benefited uh, that architecture. So that was one where we could innovate and, and do well in a challenge. Nice. And was your, was the challenge to classify the images or to do segmentation or? No, it was, to, like it was to classify the image. So they just want to, if you had something on your ankles hidden under your clothing, they wanted to know that there's a threat under the left ankle. There is 17 body zones around the person, in the lower legs, backs, and you just had to tell, uh, the neural network just had to predict a probability of a threat in a specific body part. Okay. Yeah. Any other tricks that came to bear there? You mentioned that part of the challenge had to do with just dealing with the volume of data. What did you end up doing there? Yeah, so that dealt with just writing a lot of you know code to deal with process data fast, you multi-threaded, find ways to you could optimize your training so you could load as much data as possible, as fast as possible. So that was more like a engineering challenge. You know, how do you train faster? How do you load data faster? How do you get through your training epochs faster? How do you do your inferencing faster? So and where did you do all this? Did you have, uh, did you use university equipment or did you have your own equipment or did you use cloud? So I use AWS, Amazon. I, I rent um, um, GP instances on Amazon. Okay. And what did you end up spending to on the competition? So this competition, we spent probably maybe two thousand mm -hmm. dollars in GPU compute costs over over three months. What did you end up winning? What 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 is third place? Uh, third place was was worth two hundred thousand dollars. Nice. So good profit margin. There. Yeah. Was, <laughs> <laughs> that was a good profit margin. I, I guess I'm I'm curious, like the way you thought about the spend on AWS. You know, bef you know, obviously before the competition ended, you didn't know if you were winning, but you had signal that you were doing well. Like, did you kind of managing it, or did you? Yeah, yeah. You you, you you definitely manage it. You definitely manage it. Um, you have to weigh the cost and the benefit. And fortunately, um, usually what I do is as soon as I enter, I want to see myself in the top 30 to give, to know if it's worth, you know, pushing harder, maybe spending more. Mm -hmm. So that's usually how it works. You know, I usually come up with an approach. I hardly ever pivot in these competitions. I, I kind of try to come up with a plan that- Before and, you even start. Yeah, before I start. and. I, I want that plan to to show signs of promise right away, because mm -hmm. oftentimes my my strategy is that I hardly ever pivot. I hate pivoting because when when in these challenges, usually you find out you waste a lot of time experimenting with with approaches that just lead to dead ends. So I try to think out the problem well ahead of time, and then just give it a shot at that first approach and and hope it. It shows good promise. It's almost like because of the the factors that you describe, like a lot of winning the competition is being on the the winning side of a, an information asymmetry. And so the approach is one of, you know, figuring in a figuring out a, a strategy and yeah. if you end up in the top 30 it means you're probably not on the losing side on the losing dramatic side. you know dramatically on the losing side of some information asymmetry whereas yeah it's, that's an interesting way to think about it has that way of thinking about it evolved over the four years you've been doing this or did you did you start pivoting like everybody else does yeah sometimes you know if 
a lot of time, it depends on the interest in the competition. If there's a lot of interest, uh, just my personal interest in this is a lot, I, I will pivot if something is not working and I'll, because I don't mind. But if it's not there, you know, yeah. So I, I, it's mm. not like I, I don't pivot, but it's it's just if if the cost of time and commitment you need, you can kind of gauge that from the first time you see the competition is a lot. You, you don't want to spend too much time. And also there's also this diminishing return effect where if you pivot, at least this is just my approach, is that if you try too many ideas that fail, it's kind of defeating. So you want to kind of throw your hard punch the first time and try to kind of get a good result that way. That's kind of how I approach it. Is, are there some competitions that you join to play and others that you join to win? Is yeah. Yeah. Most of the competitions I do well in are computer vision. So uh -huh. I, I usually try to do computer vision to do well in and win. Uh, the other machine learning competitions, I do them to learn and to figure out things. What are some other examples of this idea of kind of exploiting unique aspects of the, the problem? Yeah, so, uh, and this is, uh, these are some of my secrets. Uh, I don't, I don't know if I want to give away too much, but um, <laughs> I find the discussion forums on Kaggle uh, very, very useful. Like what participants are talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the times, you know, you read through those forums, and you can kind of, you can kind of get a sense of an approach, or some, or you can find kind of connect threads. So that's another part. You try to find information you need that maybe people haven't seen. But there's something they're all trying to say, but I don't know how to explain it. But there's there is information in just reading the mindsets or trying to understand what people's experiences are. Because oftentimes, that aspect of it too, you know, people who are doing well, sometimes they're usually quiet. That was one mm. thing I noticed in Kaggle too, was when I started, the people at the top of the leaderboard, I always try to look to see what they're talking about. And they're, you never find anything because they're just quiet. It's like they know something and they don't want to share, <laughs> you know? So there's that aspect of trying to dig in the forums of, to try to, you know, trying to try to learn approaches that could help and not challenge. That makes me think a little bit about uh, research in, in general and how, you know, often you'll find that there are a bunch of, you know, more or less kind of parallel introductions of innovative ideas because, you know, some period of time before, like there was something in the air and nobody quite knew how to say it, exactly. but there was something in the air. And, and if you can kind of figure that out, that'll yeah. lead you down the road to some innovation. Exactly. That's, that's kind of what I'm trying to say. So you also participated in a uh, distracted driver competition. That was what State Farm yeah, that was, was, what was that one all about? Yeah, that challenge was a challenge to uh, identify distracted drivers. Uh, I think there are different things. Was the driver playing with the radio? Was the driver looking? I've forgotten all the categories in that challenge, but it was kind of to identify distracted drivers. And that was just, they had a dash cam in the car, and the task was to kind of, indicate what if the driver was paying attention to driving or was the driver eating or drinking or using makeup or or playing with the radio or doing something else so that was another uh, imaging competition i did well in um the trick we uh, uh, one of the uh things i did in that one that really helped was um we used a, a clever data augmentation technique that it, it enabled us augment the data a lot um, we kind of, um, I don't know, I can explain, I don't know if it's relevant, but I can explain the technique is we, yeah, please. we, so if you, if you, if, 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 if we had two images of a driver that was playing with the radio, mm -hmm. right. Two different drivers, we could take, uh, 75% of one image and combine it with the remaining 25% of the other image and form a new image. So that creates a kind of augment, uh, an additional image. So it's, it's more likely some part of the driver, it just, that augmentation approach allowed us to create a lot more. You had a, a picture of one driver yeah. 
playing with the radio and then a picture of the same driver not playing no. with the radio? No, no, no. The, different... the, pi- the picture of a different driver they said was playing with the video. So with the radio. Two drivers that are both playing with the radio. Yeah. You created a new other image. images. And yeah. was this a, like a linear interpolation of the two images? Yeah, yeah. This is just a flat combination. You just combine them. You take uh, some percentage of this one and some percentage. Yeah. And you, you, you join them horizontally or vertically. And because you're just trying to learn, the neural network has to be able to learn. You know, if it sees a partial image of somebody doing something, it, there's still enough information there to to kind of try to estimate the best uh, prediction. Oh, so you're literally just like 75% of the image horizontally is one picture and 25% is another picture. Yeah. And that worked? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I, and we did that. We were able to, I think, I don't know, we had maybe some. What made them. you try that? Um, we're trying to deal with overfitting, right? So the, the problem with the way the data was collected was that there were a few subjects in the in the training set, and neural networks tend to overfit. They just memorize, right? They just memorize um, the images, mm-hmm. right? Because once they see some weird the visor in a certain position or some unique feature in the image, they just latch onto that and they make the correct prediction every time in training. But that doesn't generalize to it doesn't generalize to an unseen validation set because they're exploiting, you know peculiarities of each. So by doing this augmentation strategy, you kind of break all those false assumptions that the neural network might have made um, to improve. So it really has to learn the the task of maybe identifying when the driver is playing with the radio. So, mm. Wow. Uh, did you also innovate on the model architecture or no, we, something we, off the shelf? We, no, we just used off the shelf in that one. We didn't do anything special with the model architecture. And a lot of Kaggle competitions are won by like these really kind of monstrosity ensembles of things. Is that true generally in vision or less so? Yeah, um, it's true in vision, but it's true in vision when you get to in certain competitions. Um, in other competitions, like the the Homeland Security Challenge, we, we, we could have kept our position with one model. So um, it's true, but um, if one model is, if you really spend time, can do, if you focus on one model, you can almost do as well as a massive ensemble. But oftentimes the ensemble is the easy way out. But the ensembles, there's a cost associated with that, at least for computer vision in terms of GPU time. If you have infinite uh, compute resources, you might be able to get away with ensembling. But Oftentimes, you have to weigh the cost of training many models with, you know, focusing on one and trying to get it as good as possible. So if you were starting Kaggle today, um, we actually, we've got a study group. uh, These are folks that are, it's kind of like an online meetup of, of folks that are, you know, doing Kaggle together. They've been, I think it's been going for maybe eight weeks now. Um and they may be about to start a new kind of a new session of it. But, you know, the sense is that, you know, one of the key things to do is to you know, find other folks to work with. Is that is that true? Is that true in your experience? Yeah. Working with other people usually helps, you know, sharing ideas and, and kind of kind of, you know, creating diversity of approaches. Most of my competitions have, have teamed up with somebody and everybody brings unique um perspectives that help in challenges. If you were talking to folks that are interested in starting, like how would you advise them to to kind of go at it? To uh, it, Okay, so one part of, of at least I see, is that uh, in AI, a lot of people make things a little more complicated than they need to be. Really? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's new information, but um, <laughs> so so the key is, is actually the, the solutions to problems, at least my approach is that the solutions are usually simple. They're not, they're not complicated. And um, a barrier to starting Kaggle is that there's this idea that it's hard, it's difficult. You need, to, if you look at AI, for example, and the progression of deep learning, at least from my experience and my research, 
the key contributions have been really simple ideas. So, uh, for example, um, be, uh, before 2012, when AlexNet won, won that computer vision challenge, there was this idea that neural networks were hard to train. There was this vanishing gradient problem. There was all this stuff going on. You just couldn't train neural networks. And Yoshio Benjiro wrote a paper on the difficulties of training neural networks. And what he found was that the activation function they were using, which was the sigmoid, was causing, um, was the problem. So all, in my opinion, all the breakthroughs we've seen has, has been a result of the relative activation function that, that sort of eliminated that vanishing gradient problem, right? Mm. So that idea is pretty simple. It was a simple change in the activation function. Mm -hmm. But between then and the other next key contribution, there are a lot of complex things that people explain and try to cloud the actual real important things that push the ball forward. You know, so and, and Kegel is sort of the same way. Like um I kind of feel like um a lot of challenges you just have to kind of look at it with a creative approach and just just open your mind that the answer the solution is simple. This is just you're just a, a few a few ideas away from having kind of like a really good solution. Mm -hmm. So, and I think, um, so, so joining teams is, is teaming up with, with, with people is a good, is a good idea, but generally you just have to believe that you can, you can do well in a challenge and, and really give it a shot mm -hmm. because Kegel can be discouraging. You know, it's, it can be discouraging if you go in and you don't do well. Fortunately for me, I didn't experience that. I, well, maybe my first challenge, because you know, my first challenge, I thought, yes, I'm going to blow this thing away, and you know, you you, you, you can't be, <laughs> you'll be really surprised, you know, how how much you still have to learn. Yeah, so teaming up is a is a good way, but I I still feel you you can do it on your own. Just have the motivation to to enter a challenge and and stick at it. Don't don't um don't get discouraged if you don't do well initially. So. Teaming up, persistence, keeping it simple. Uh, uh, what, I, what else? Yeah, that's that's about it. And um, and reading top solutions, mm -hmm. uh, following up on at the end of the challenge. And oftentimes, Kegel, the winners usually share their approaches and follow up and kind of look and correlate what the winners did with what you did and what you could have done that or that you missed. So I think that's it. It's really following up and just being persistent. So those are the kind of the general tips for folks that want to get started. What about the expert tips for folks that have bang been banging their head against it for a while and haven't gotten to, you know, where they'd like to get? Do you have any, you know, I think, I think or ninja habits or anything like that? I think those tips are universal. Those tips works for the expert too. The experts, if they stay persistent, they look at the solutions of the top teams, what they did. Um, that's it. Okay. <laughs> you just kept it simple. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. You know, what we didn't talk about yet is analytical AI, which is your uh, your day job. What What is that? What do you do there? Yeah, so at analytical AI, we, uh, due to the Homeland Security Challenge, we got a couple of projects. We're developing um, various, we're working with various uh, equipment manufacturers to that are usually in the security space to help uh, identify threats either on person screening or in baggage, CT, or x-ray. And we're also working on various uh, fintech products uh, where we're trying to use AI for things like technical analysis and things like that. Interesting. So you know what I did? I, I did, This wasn't a full interview, but I've talked to a group down in... Austin, I think, and I've seen a couple of press releases about this. Um, I get a couple a year of groups that are using a bunch of sensors, maybe mounted on a police vehicle on a dr or on a drone that are like trying to identify the presence of weapons, um, you know, on a person. Uh, and the drone mounted ones are the ones that are kind of the most crazy sounding like yeah does, does that stuff work is that kind of in the domain of stuff that you've been looking at that, that's not necessarily the domain of what we're uh looking at uh like we're we're looking at working with teams that make things like passive screening like terahertz and you know like um 
or or, or X-ray for baggage mm-hmm. at the airport. It's not like drone mounted or these are like uh, people screening devices. Like they station it somewhere and they try to make you work through maybe at events or stadiums and identify threats on their clothing and things like that. Okay. Okay. So you had no, no opinion on the drone mounted viability. Of- no. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, David, it has been great chatting with you. Thanks so much for sharing a bit about what you've been up to and all of the great Kaggle tips. Yeah, thanks. It was great talking to you too, Sam. Thanks. Thanks, David. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. To learn more about today's guest or the topics mentioned in the interview, visit twimlai.com slash shows. Don't forget to check out our demo cast with Vila at twomalai.com slash Metaflow. And of course, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're there. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on your favorite podcatcher. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.